So, I would like to change to another of the Buddha's greatest hits on loving kindness. And this truly is, uh, this is a less known sutta. The, the Metta Sutta, Karaniya Metta Sutta, which uh, I just spent eight uh, talks on, is the best known. It is the one of the two or three cardinal suttas that you will hear chanted all over the Theravada Asian world, and also, in the course, in the English world as well. But there is another one which I came across many, many years ago, at least, well, 30 years ago, perhaps. And I thought, wow, it's a marvelous little um, thing. And it is, uh, if you want to find it, it's in the numbered sayings, it's the 11s of the numbered sayings. That's a collection of the suttas. That's called the benefits of loving kindness, the 11 benefits of loving kindness. Sometimes it's referred to also as the metta sutta. And I will just recite it for you. Um, o bhikkhus, there are 11 benefits from loving kindness that arise from the emancipation of the heart. If repeated, developed, made much of, made a habit of, made a basis of, experienced, practiced, well started, these 11 benefits are expected. One sleeps well, one wakes up well, one does not have nightmares, one becomes affectionate to human beings, one becomes affectionate to non-human beings, the deities protect one, neither fire nor poison nor weapons harm one, one's mind is easily calmed, one's countenance is serene, one dies without confusion, Beyond that, if one fails to attain Nibbana, one is reborn in the higher heavens. So I would just like to start with the, I know we want to rush on to the benefits, but uh, before you get the benefits, uh, there's some investment required. <laughs> so this is the Buddha making sure you understand just how much practice this can take. There are, in all walks of life, there are prodigies. There are people who seem to be able to instantly understand and practice and perform uh, certain things. There are math prodigies and musical prodigies. And uh, there are also loving kindness prodigies. But most of us are not Mozart. So... Buddha says, don't think this will just arrive in your lap. This is something that requires practice. But if you have experienced the benefits of applied effort and practice and good teaching in uh, the worldly arts, uh, all of the worldly arts, your, your regular education, you understand how, how training works, including physical education and, and the sports and so forth, how many hours and how much inquiry put, people put into this. This is, again, this is a craft. So Buddhism is very much not something that falls out of the sky on you. It is not something that you receive uh, as, as in grace. It is not given to you from an external agency. It is developed and cultivated in the same way that a uh, garden is developed and cultivated. And just to the extent that you have the skills and the understanding and you get good instruction and good inspiration and that you keep up your energies for this and you apply yourself in an intelligent way, then you will get good results. If not, you will get either lopsided results or poor results. If you also, if you just hope for a moment of inspiration, you meet, you meet a saint somewhere and uh, are uplifted for a, a day and a half or something like this, but then you walk away 
wishing to have the experience again, that's, that's too bad. <laughs> that's really too bad. Lots of people look for those kind of religious experiences. They, they hope in contact with a certain person that somehow this will, uh, is how the transference happens. But from a Buddhist point of view, no. I mean, you can get inspired, you can be around people who help you, and anybody who is skilled at this is good to hang out with. So this is one of the things that the Buddha suggested, that if you want to understand the Buddhist scriptures, the, the teachings, the suttas, you hang out with those who know them well and have analyzed them and uh, processed the information in them, organized it, so then you would, you would be amongst them. If you want to cultivate jhana, deep samadhi, then you hang out with samadhi people. Uh, if you want to uh, practice the divine abidings, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity, you uh, abide with those who immerse themselves in that, have a lot of capacity for that, and try to convey any helpful information to you. So now there are different sanghas and different groups of people, and you will go to retreats, etc., where the atmosphere in some retreats is, is rather militaristic. It's the emphasis on really strong kind of determined effort without any regard to the, the warmth, um, the warming emotion of loving kindness, you will, <laughs> a noticeable absence, a strong noticeable absence of this, more or less a stern attempt to discipline yourself. These are not, I mean, these are, they have their purposes and their effects. And you will, you can attend university, you can go to graduate school and do a doctorate in various arcane uh, concepts in Buddhism. I, I know somebody who did a, an entire doctorate on the word Sankara. <laughs> what did they do their master's on? Sanya. <laughs> so a master's thesis on a single word, Sanya, perception, and a doctoral thesis on Sankara, volitional formations. Uh, so you can do that. And of course, you would have all the atmosphere of a university and all the intellectual firepower that they have. But now this is a different thing. And uh, this cultivation of loving kindness is something that is, you take it up as a sadhana, a kind of a, a, a single-minded practice. And you, uh, you engage in it, immerse in it. So this is, this is what the Buddha is saying in the first um, stanza here, that there are 11 benefits from loving kindness and they arise from the emancipation of the heart. Now that's an English translation, emancipation, but it's, it's yes, um, you might, re emancipation is, is when you get your freedom to be freed from something servitude of some sort. And so what is the servitude that you are freed from? The servitude is the, your harassment by the five hindrances, the five psychic irritants of anger and greed, agitation, depression, sloth, heaviness, and uh, doubt. And so these are, these are the five hindrances and they are your owners. They run your life. And to uh, endeavor with this application of loving kindness is to determine to free yourself from these things. It's not a pretty picture what your inner experience will be like if you are dominated by these hindrances. And so this is a kind of liberation that the Buddha is talking about. You will hear uh, this kind of talk around uh, insight as well. Samatha, vipassana kind of um, language, it, of course, is, is uh, all towards this freedom, vimuti, freedom, liberation. So this loving kindness is how you emancipate the heart, how you liberate the heart, how you, now the heart is your emotional structure. Not, and uh, I wouldn't say that your emotional structure is 
fully adequate. It, th that phrase is not fully adequate. It's your whole being. Everything about you, including your body, how you experience your body, and including how you experience the very the weight of your body. It also liberates you how you experience time, how you experience uh, your the clarity of your thought as well. So this is this is a, a magic potion which you pour into your system and which changes your relationship to the body, to the mind, and to the emotional center. Everything is transformed by this. It's an utter, it's, a, it's the ultimate medicine. It's what frees you. It also leads, as you can see at the end of the Buddha talks, if one does not manage to attain Nibbana, one is reborn in the higher heavens. That is the booby prize. That is for failure. <laughs> Your, uh, now that, that rebirth in the heavens starts before you die as well. These are sublime abidings which are to be entered in this very life, and they're to be entered through consciousness. And I, I, I give endless talks about this. Not in it, not in any way denying the reality of other dimensions, other types of realms. But that they cannot they cannot be experienced except through consciousness. So if I take a dog to a great art gallery, the dog is not in a great art gallery. He's mostly interested in the smell of oil paints. <laughs> he can't wait to get out of there. <laughs> he wants something to eat rather. Now, if you take a child, a, a four-year-old child to an art gallery, they also are oblivious to most of what's going on. And if you take uh, an uncultured person to the art gallery, again, very little is happening. So they, they all have gone to the same place and had different experiences. And then you take somebody who's very, very acutely cultured and and they may have an, a transcendental experience there, even on the, the site of a single painting. The same goes to great music. Uh, in fact, I was in a classical music and I, I had my friends that I'd gone to high school with, we all played together in, you know, folk bands and rock bands and stuff. And uh, it wouldn't have served much purpose for me to take them to the symphony. They would have had a boring experience. <laughs> so there isn't really a place that you can go in the universe. There's only consciousness that you can bring to the universe. It's your mind. Um, so wherever you go, how it, it, this is how you experience these dimensions of being, including the human realm. The Buddha is very clear to define what a human is. And it's interesting that many uh, great philosophers have attempted to define what a human is. Uh, Plato tried to give a very succinct description of a human as a featherless biped. <laughs> Humans walk on two legs and they have no feathers. Brilliant, actually. But there was another competing uh, philosopher named Diogenes who heard this and thought it entirely inadequate. So he went to uh, Plato's grove of academe and threw a plucked chicken in Well, Plato was giving a talk. So a featherless biped ran across in front of the audience. Is that a human? It walks on two feet two legs and has no feathers? Is a plucked chicken a human? No. So the Buddha was very careful not to define a human in those terms. Humanity is something, is one that has cultivated the heart of empathy, that which recognizes other beings as having similar uh, feelings that a human has. So this is the basis of what is called virtue, the five precepts. And so what, how does the Buddha define the human realm is one who does not 
observe and understand and feel the five precepts is in danger of becoming inhuman. Subhuman. It's not whether you walk on two legs or not that makes you human. It's an understanding and empathy with other beings that makes you a human. So this can be fulfilled the, uh, behind the curtain of virtuous behavior is really loving kindness. And uh, if you have a lot of trouble following the rules of the, the five precepts, then look deeper into your heart and cultivate loving kindness. And then how, why would you then kill a living being? Why would you injure a living being? Why would you deceive a living being? etc., including the last precept, which is uh, the, uh, the avoidance of intoxicants. I think intoxicants and certain drugs are people's attempts to get relief from the harassment of the five hindrances. Their inner life is cold and uh, unsuitable and uncomfortable. There's something lacking in the inner life. And therefore, you get a little relief sometimes, or you believe you do, from things like alcohol or other types of drugs. And, uh, and people will tell you straight up that they take it because it relieves their pain for a while. Uh, it has a nasty uh, after effects, though. And you get mired deeper and deeper. And when you're in an intoxicated condition, you tend to have poor judgment, and it's very easy to step across the boundaries of the other four precepts. Loving kindness relieves the need for relief. It is relief. And so this is what you'll see with people who have transformations in life. When they encounter the capacity to experience loving kindness, and by the way, it isn't because other people love them that they experience loving kindness. They must love others in order to experience loving kindness. They can't get it from somebody else. And you'll see this. Sometimes people are from very loving families and they simply are incapable of experience comfort because they don't radiate it to others. And of course, they don't radiate to themselves as well. So you'll see this absence of, they have failed to pass the basic IQ test of full humanity. And that is, you haven't understood that you must dwell in loving kindness. And just to the extent that you do, you will feel well. And just to the extent that you do not, you will not feel well. So this is the nature of loving kindness. And so the Buddha makes a great deal of this. He says, if repeated, developed, made much of, made a habit of, made a basis of, experienced, practiced, well started, then these 11 benefits are expected. So this uh, is worth going over a little bit. So repetition, if repeated. And it would not, it's not simply the repetition of the words. May all beings be well, happy, and peaceful. May I be well, happy, and peaceful. It's not enough. It's the repetition of inquiry. First of all, inquiry. Before you get it, you have to ask, what is it? And by the way, if you haven't experienced it before, you don't know what it is. Lots of people do not know what the feeling of love is. And I'm not talking about romantic love, although that too Lots of people, you know, it's kind of a status symbol to, to be in love. It's a it kind of a report back that, oh, it's a good thing. And lots of people then think, I'm a, I must be in love too, because it's a good thing to have. And then they say, I, I love. And they don't. <laughs> because they don't behave as if they are experiencing that emotion. You can see in their, the way they behave and where they the way they think, the way they speak, and the way they behave does not correspond with this feeling of being in love. Being in love, now there's, there's various types of, of that. There's romantic love, and then there's 
uh, friend, friendship, love. Uh, uh, but friendship, love is is conditional. So you love your friend because of certain characteristics and qualities of them. Many people cannot even manage to do that. They are they just utter the words and they go through the motions, but they have no inner satisfaction from this. And it's too bad because even just to have a friend, even though that because the friend has certain qualities, oh, they're funny or they're they're talented or they, they like you or et cetera. This is already a beautiful experience and humans crave that. They want that. And if they don't have that and, and, and a substantial portion of the population has never experienced that, then your inner life will be barren to the extent that you will manifest peculiar side effects from that. You will behave in a certain way and including self-destruction. Because the inner life is uncomfortable and inadequate, then one starts to seek a way out because it's painful to live that way. So there is no option here. People seek temporary relief, as I say, in, in various uh, medications or distractions. So that's also what people do is they distract themselves as long as possible with games and all kinds of things. But if their fundamental being is devoid of this, it's very uncomfortable. So this is, this, uh, whatever repetition it takes, you, you need to do it. It's worthwhile. And it may, just like anything else, I mean, really, if you want to learn to juggle or if you want to learn to play ping pong or something or ride a bicycle, you have to repeat it again and again. By the way, if you do manage to ride a bicycle, if you get the feeling, then, um, as I say, you kind of never forget. It's, there's a moment when you suddenly have that eureka moment where you understand how the thing balances. And this is the experience of loving kindness. So... Sometimes in the company of others, and for some people, it's the company of animals. Uh, you know, you, you see these experiments in, in prisons where people end up in prison because they, they obviously are, have an inner life that's deprived of well-being and they, they've acted out and caused pain and anguish. And of course, the inner insight into that is that they don't have empathy and quite often they do not regard humans as trustworthy. So it's only when they encounter animals who have no kind of filter, they, um, they don't care how bad you smell. <laughs> Your dog doesn't care if you're pretty or <laughs> ugly, <laughs> whether you have hairs growing out of your ears or anything. So you'll see people on the street with dogs and the dog just uh, has no, no, uh, no conditions to the loving kindness that they have towards that human. And that, that enriches the life. So you can get it from external uh, sources for a bit. All right, may, it may be the initial cause of it, at least for a moment, just a moment of it. And then you might be able to pick it up and work your way into the human realm and beyond. Because as we talked about before, Ultimately, this emotion takes you to the divine abidings. It's beyond human. It's superhuman. It's above human. You know, they have a lot of these movies with superheroes now. I don't know what it is with the superhero. I, I, I remember when I was eight and I read comic books about the superheroes, but really, mainstream movies, superheroes and everything... Why isn't there a, a lover man, <laughs> lover woman or something like somebody who's just purely blissfully, <laughs> their only power is, is friendliness. <laughs> that is the super normal attainment of a human. That is the, the basis of all other great powers. So if repeated and developed, so once you get it, once you get a little bit of it, it needs to be developed. So it's not enough. You have to really water it after that and understand the, 
the ingredients that help maintain it. So it's not enough to just hit on it and then do it again and again. It has to grow. So this is development is, is a kind of what bhavana or cultivation or gardening. It needs to grow. And uh, don't be humble. Uh, look for, don't stay with just the backyard. Go for the 40 acres. <laughs> Make a big field. And that is uh, some of the similes that the Buddha uses as a, a vast, he uses these images of vast uh, radiation. Vast, think of it as vast, and the heart becoming vast and encompassing the universe. So swallowing whole world systems. No problem. So it should be made much of, meaning that um, it should be highly valued. It becomes your obsession. So you people, you know, they spend their lives playing chess or violin or something like this. Really? Uh, okay. Or watching soccer or something. This is just, uh, this is, those are small games. And look at how much satisfaction people do get out of that. They make whole lives around that. But those are small potatoes. You really need to, to look more deeply and uh, demand full growth. M make much of this. Uh, make it great. And so, and then a habit of. So it becomes second nature. And anything you do long enough will become second nature. That is the nature of human uh, structures, but unfortunately it works both ways. So if you're angry all the time, you will be effortlessly angry. If you, if you do not resist and insist that you should not lapse into depression, you will become depressed all the time. Any of these things can become habitual and they take on a life of their own. They become second nature and eventually they become first nature. So this is uh, both scary and um, also hopeful because if you do this enough, it will become you and it will be effortless after a while. You will, of course, you want to be there, but you often don't have the skills of how to get there and how to stay there. But once you get there, stay there, and then see how long you can remain there, Eventually, you'll be able to do this day and night. And so this is the Buddha. We were talking about it in the previous sutta. Can you do this all the live long day? So the, the Buddha talks about his disciples who can remain in this, in the metta vihara, the sublime divine abiding, day and night. Not just for one day and night, but indefinitely. They can remain in that. Just as you can remain in a depression, you can remain irritable and angry day and night, week and month and year and decade and lifetime and lifetimes. Yes, any of those things. So you got your choices. Which would you prefer? Would you like a life of misery? Can I, can I sell you this? Or would you like a life of profound, almost unimaginable ease and well-being. Which one will you buy? Because it's up to you. And nobody actually can give you either of these. You select them. And you select, of course, the life of misery just out of ignorance. And you select the life of well-being and loving kindness out of wisdom. Wisdom and loving kindness are uh, two sides of the same coin. You can use it as a basis. So out uh, a basis for what? A basis for all kinds of things, all kinds of clarity of mind. You can use loving kindness to create positive situations, both for yourself and for other beings. So where do these great ideas come up? Where do uh, the idea of adopting uh, uh, children who have no parents come out of? They come out of loving kindness, a great idea. Or the kind... Uh, you know, the treatment, uh, you know, the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Where does that come from? It comes from loving kindness. Where So many great poems, some great music, great art, great buildings, social 
uh, structures, political structures, uh, what's the basis of them? A loving kindness. So they, it serves as a basis for these other things. So this is it's not limited. It has all kinds of ramifications and other things. It develops all kinds of uh, skills as well. So the next word is experienced. Uh, you become experienced in it. You immerse in it. You have experience. As you do in all kinds of, you are an experienced person. And this is a complete and immersive experience. And you get good at, if you lose it, you, you find it, you immediately recognize that you've lost it, and then you go back to it. So this is part of experience. Now, how would you lose it? Probably um, as a result of the wrong company. People come to the monastery, go on loving kindness retreats, and after 10 days, they come in smiling and in peace. And they ask me, how can I keep this up? And I tell them usually, well, I'll tell you how you're going to lose it. <laughs> and it won't be because of the weather. It won't be because of trees or traffic. It'll actually be because of people. <laughs> And it will be people who are actually close to you. <laughs> if you have people in your life that are not full of loving kindness and wisdom, that's a very strong stimulus. And when you're in a nice supportive environment, like a monastery retreat center and nature, uh, being encouraged through Dhamma talks, then uh, it can be very easy, but the strongest stimulus around you are very unskillful people who, who you have history with that you know well. They can disturb your loving kindness. But your job is to recognize this and to know and to become wary of this and to know how to have escape hatches for this and not to put yourself in situations where you're... Uh, you're your skills are overwhelmed. It's possible to get to a state where nothing overwhelms your skills. There's a story about uh, by the Dalai Lama interviewing monks who had been in prison by the Chinese for up to 20 years. And the Chinese Red Army was very hard on the monks. They tried to make sure that they couldn't meditate and all this kind of stuff, and they, they harassed them, etc., to make it difficult. So he was talking to a senior. He, this was an abbot, uh, a senior lama, who had been imprisoned for 20 years, and, of course, many of them were tortured as well. And he was hearing, the Dalai Lama was hearing the story of this imprisonment by this monk, and it was horrific. And then he asked the monk, oh, were you ever afraid? He said, once or twice. And what were you afraid of? He says, I was afraid I might get angry. It wasn't, it, the, 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 the guards are not your enemy. The torturers are not your enemy. The only thing to fear is that you might lose your loving kindness. That's the worst thing. So under those circumstances, it's possible to keep it, and the worst thing is to lose it. Now, most of us are not at that stage, but uh, you have to be careful with who you interact with, and this is important. It's not just to walk randomly through life. So the Buddha gives you advice not to associate with the foolish, to associate with the wise. And that means making choices about how and who you spend your time with and being very careful if, and there are circumstances where you can't get out of it as, as if you're in prison, it's not a matter of, I don't want to be here. I think I'll leave. Uh, sometimes in work situations and family situations, you can't get out of it. Uh, but you need to make very clear to yourself that you, you need to not fall into old habits and patterns. And you need to 
find strategies and skillful means for keeping you from going beyond your capacities and limits with people. There's much to say about that. I have all kinds of practical advice, which we will not get into in this, this retreat or talk, but it's something to explore this idea. Anyway, I've gone on for quite some time now, and uh, we have another talk, which I will continue with this particular sutta on the 11 benefits of loving kindness for tomorrow.